Morning, Neil Sean here on Sunrise with a man that needs no introduction. It's the legendary Mr. Dave Stewart. Remember though, Dave? If you miss it, you miss out. Don't miss Dave this morning on Sunrise. Thank you. Where was I a bit late? No, 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 it's fine. Don't worry. My, my brain sort do, of stopped for a second. Do you want to do another one? You want yeah, to do it again? Yeah, one more time. Right. I'll forget mine now. <laughs> Morning, Neil Sean here on Sunrise with a man that needs no introduction. It's the legendary Mr. Dave Stewart. Remember though, Dave? If you miss it, you miss out. Don't miss Dave this morning on Sunrise. Thank you. That was good, <laughs> that was good fun. Let me take your stuff off. Thank you so much. Dave, a pleasure to meet you. And I really mean that, a complete pleasure to meet you. Now, Thanks. Tower Music Festival, tell me about that. Yeah, I was very surprised um, when I went and had a look at the venue on the web because uh, I was trying to think, how do you play inside the Tower of London? Obviously it's been going a couple of, couple of years now, but it's an incredible uh, venue, um, actually, you know, as a, as a gig. But also, I can imagine going to that concert is very exciting because you're going inside the Tower of London for a start. Well, that's got a bit of a grisly past. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd been waiting for years and years and years uh, to play live again, and I got involved in so many things and I, I realised a lot of the time I was having so many meetings and meetings and meetings. Like I suppose when people are at college and they want to be an architect and they think, oh I'm going to create buildings and, and then they realise they spend the rest of their life in meetings. So I thought, how do I play live, you know, just because for the fun of it. And then I decided to look, well, I could just look at the songbook of all the songs I've been writing. And that's when I put the word out and got approached by the Tower of London Music Festival uh -huh. and then I thought wow with a venue like that I'll have a I want to make it epic so I'm doing it with a 30 piece orchestra as well as a seven piece band. Great and I mean as you say an orchestra is a nice change to see isn't it this day and age? Well really yeah, I mean you know <clears throat> I always like to visualize things and I, I thought mm, imagine a 30 piece orchestra playing Sweet Dreams in the Tower of London you know with all of the uh, surrounding sort of lights and paraphernalia, and I thought, that's pretty epic. Now, there's a great, um, uh, uh, it's a once in a lifetime thing, really. You are looking for a person to come and join you to sing. There must be an angel. Now, that's right. Couldn't believe it when your people told me this, oh, this is fantastic. Well, How see, does it work? Well, the funny thing is that, um, you know, when I was rehearsing, my band's all American, because I live in America, and, you know, people don't realize this, but when you release, records like when you re Eurythmics released, released records we'd have smash sort of songs in America like Missionary Man Would I Lie to You which in England were hits but you know yeah. number 13 or number 12 There Must Be an Angel which was number one in Britain when I said to my band in America I'm gonna do this one they all looked blank because in America that wasn't a big hit you know it was I don't think it was even in the top hundred so anyway then I had an idea why not put it out to the audience uh, in Britain, you know, if you can prove to me that you can sing really well, There Must Be an Angel, then the prize is you get to sing it with a 30-piece orchestra at the Tower of London Festival live on stage with me and my band. And I thought, anybody who's got the balls to do that, then I'll fly them to LA and record a song of their choice to, you know, the promoters of the gig. Mm -hmm. And they were over the moon about it, and I said, well, there's bound to be somebody out there. It's a very complicated song to sing, you know. I'm, not, I'm giving you the most complicated eurythmic song to sing. But there will be somebody out there who can do it. And you say that, I mean, it is a beautiful song and it was a number one smash. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, you, for you, is that a personal favourite? Is that what did you kind of think, mm, I like that as well? You know, is this when you. Um, I love the song, and of course, Annie, you know, who's a brilliant singer in every way, you know. Um, it was always a challenging song for her to sing, and, and uh, we played it in many different ways. But, you know, it's not a song that I'm going to attempt to sing. And, um, and I think, you know, when you see lots of people entering into song competitions and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and, but this is very different. This is to do with singing one song brilliantly and ending up straight away on stage, three or 4,000 people, 30-piece orchestra, and see what that feels like live. So I should imagine it's quite scary, but to do it, all you have to do is go to my website, davestewart.com, and it, it'll it explain what you do. There's a little track there to download. You can sing along with your webcam or whatever. And myself and my friend, Glenn Ballard, who's a record producer, who's made Annie's new album, by the way, which is excellent, and he produced 
Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill, as amongst others. We can view these Gosh. little uh, video blogs and then it'll whittle down to 10 and eventually three and then one. As you say, anybody who's uh, gutsy enough, it's a big challenge that, isn't it? I have mm -hmm. to be honest. Now, you've got, as you say, you're doing the songbook and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what a songbook. Uh, I was reading uh, your CV and you're a guy from Sunderland. Mm -hmm. So the journey from Sunderland to where you are now and you've written all these great tunes. Can you believe that when you look back at your songbook and think, God, I remember, yeah, I remember when <laughs> I wrote that one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's funny when I went into it, you know, because I don't usually look back at it. So when I went into it with the band to decide what to play and mainly influenced by what goes well with mm. orchestration. Yeah, well, it was like shocking, you know, then people who I really were fans of and admired, like, you know, Mick Jagger and loads of people, Lou Reed, um, you know, Sinead O'Connor, even when she came out similar time to uh, Annie and myself, well a bit later actually, I just thought she was staggering and then to write a song with her was really exciting. Uh, writing songs with Terry Hall from The Specials who I thought were one of the most amazing mm -hmm. bands. Um, yeah, it's shocking and obviously you know working with Aretha Franklin, working all these different people, I never imagined it in a million years. You've got to check out the web pages, it's brilliant. You see all these <laughs> great pictures and you think, there's just everybody on this songbook, you know, it's wonderful. So when you write songs now, I mean, you, do you do it in a special way or do you have like a moment, you know, where a day where you think, I'm going to write something today or does it just come to you? I mean, songwriters with your, your catalogue, you must be doing it a lot or mm. do, you, do you just wait until they come to you as you were say, on a plane or something? Well, yeah, well, I was told about this to somebody earlier. See, I can't sit with a blank piece of paper and a piano and go, uh, what rhymes with, you know. Yeah. Um, it tends to just come and it's usually in an awkward position, like in the bath or, you know, in a train or in a car where you're trying to write and it's jiggling a yeah. bit. And you just can't stop it, you know. So the, the trick is to keep all those little sketches and notes and little mumblings into mm. tape recorders and I've got an archive, huge archive of sketches and bits, and I'll pull one out and go, ah, oh, right, this is one I prepared earlier, but it doesn't have a chorus. And, um, and I think most creative people, that's the way it comes. Mm. There's a discipline, obviously, of finishing them yeah. and arranging them and putting, you know, counter melodies and all that stuff, but the spontaneous sort of idea of like the hook or, or the line that grabs people usually comes when you're not expecting it. Mm. When you look at your songbook though, is there a particular favourite that you enjoy playing? I mean, mine sort of changes with you all the time. I, I kind of wondered if that's like that when you're on stage. You know, I like what I lie to you and stuff like that. I think, yeah, I really, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I've always loved playing Here Comes the Rain Again. Mm -hmm. And of course, having the big orchestra on stage to play all the parts is going to be great at the yeah. Tower of London Festival. But there's lots of songs I wrote under different names or whatever that people don't realise. Like, there's a song I wrote uh, with Shakespeare's sister, which my ex-wife was part of, called Stay With Me, which was number one here for eight weeks. Mm. And I've rearranged that with an orchestration and something like that's very interesting because I never played it before. Um, and I like, I obviously like playing Sweet Dreams because it's got that such infectious uh, rhythm, but mm. I've never done that with an orchestra and that's going to be Great, so obviously I'm going to extend that as, as far as possible and make it into an epic. Talking to Sweet Dreams, I mean, when the Euro the Week started, uh, video-wise at least, you had some very sort of, shall we say, big image changes, Dave. You know, every mm. video you had a different look. You know, you kind of, is that you? You know, and mm -hmm. it, was that a purposeful thing? Because now when we watch these videos, they have stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, you, you had a very good image around the songs. I mean, obviously that was important. Well, Annie and I like to make uh, little vignettes, like little movies about the songs, which at the beginning when we were doing it, nobody was really doing that. And then it became a thing that everybody did. Um, obviously, um, you know, the haircuts, you can go, all right, that was 1984, that was 1987, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, now we're just bombarded with so much imagery, often the simpler the better, because mm -hmm. it got so complicated and so overblown. I mean. So many videos now start off with, mm, let's get a glass pyramid in the desert and 63 dancers and it's like, uh, and the song's written by 27 people and it's got seven lyrics, you know, and yeah. it's, it's getting a bit confusing. I mean, you, at the Tower Music Festival, you've got an orchestra, as you say, and mm. we have to ask this question, I mean, would we ever get a musical from you, given your big catalogue? Could you, could you um, ever see that? It's funny you should say that, because 
I've been writing a musical for about 15 years with Ian Lafrenny and Dick Clemens, and it's called The Secret Life of Queen Victoria or Queen Victoria's Secret. We didn't want to call it Victoria's Secret, otherwise I might get confused <laughs> with a lingerie yes. company. Uh, that's in the middle of, um, you know, we're casting and looking for to do some kind of uh, preliminary workshops with it. And I'm working on another one in America right now. It's a film called The Tales of Despero, which is uh, a children's book that won, won a lot of prizes. And um, so, I, yeah, I, li I like working on stuff outside of the pop mm. vernacular, you know. Talk about film. We, saw, we uh, had a great song from you with the lovely Mick Jagger yeah. uh, from Alfie, which I loved, actually. I thought it was very mm. clever. And also, you did a movie called Honest with the All Saints, which That's right. some people were rather cruel about. I liked it. I saw the, mm. you know, what you were trying to do. Why did you pick that particular period? Did you mm. kind of like that yourself? Was that an, e an era that you wanted to go back to? Well, you know, what happened was uh, people started to, uh, in certain members of the press, started to crucify that film before we finished making it. You know, they yeah. just, you know, I think they had a thing about a pop star making a film in the All Saints, but actually, if people get it out on DVD in retrospect, it's it's meant to be. I wasn't making like um, <coughs> uh, War and Peace. <laughs> I was making a comedic, tongue-in-cheek piece about a certain part of the '60s where it, it started to collapse, and sort of cocaine came in, and lots of people moved in under the pretense of being hippies but were actually sort of dealers and strange odd people and that was an exact time when I moved to London yeah. so for me it was uh, you know very close to lots of the stuff that I witnessed. Well, I first came across your talents uh, when I went and bought So Good To Be Back Home Again oh, right, by, by Timothy White actually yes mm. by the tourists I mean when you first because obviously you had you were in bands before that had success before that mm. when you around that period because it was a wonderful period where we had supersonic top of the pops all those great things where you could yeah. get on uh, do you think it's harder now to break through given the demise of I suppose exposure for, for music or do you kind of think well the sort of internet has taken care of that and that's taken the mm. fun away of pop well <sighs> It's a very strange period for, you know, music business or, or people who want to get into music. You see, because on one hand, you have got MySpace and YouTube and all these things, but I think there's one and a half million bands on MySpace, and so far not one of them really has broken yeah. from MySpace. Um, and that's because there's something that, you know, companies have to do, record companies, which is marketing and A&R and all that kind of stuff, and bands need that. but. It's changing and there will be bands break, you know, and uh, there'll be lots of, I mean, Arctic Monkeys have proved it, Lily mm. Allen's proved it. There's the bands that will, if they create enough interesting and unique, uniqueness about what they're doing, will always break through. But that was always the same back then. Yeah, it's a, you know, the TV, unfortunately, you know, MTV came along, it was am amazing at first, mm. and then now there's nine MTVs and it's, Everybody's bombarded with so much stuff. I think in the future people will start to be selective and they'll mm. want to subscribe to only the stuff that they really like. And then you lose out because you don't obviously get mass appeal, do you? Well, I think, you know, the future of business is selling less of more. And all these books like Wikonomics or, you know, The Long Tail or there's lots of business books that explain why the future is actually not just you know mass marketing bombarding everything but like somebody like Amazon coming along and going hey we can get you that Cuban record or that yeah. Brazilian book you know it just takes a couple of days you know. For someone who's had so much success when you look back to when you were a teen growing up and thinking oh if I could have a hit record does he do you still get excited by that when your records you know you see them in the charts and you know you go into a store and you, Oh, that's still quite good. Well, it's funny enough, I, I was reading a website the other day and um, <coughs> one of the most exciting songwriting sessions I've done recently has been with a man called Lamont Dozier. Oh, yeah. And I saw this British website who is saw all the people I'd written with and they put a question mark saying, yeah, we don't know who he is either. Now, you've got to understand, Holland Dozier Holland wrote Standing in the Shadows of Love, Reach Out, I'll Be There, Baby. I like all these Motown hits, yeah. I think 51 number one singles in a row. Wow. And um, and he's such a lovely guy, and we've been writing some songs together. So I get a kick out of that. Or sitting, you know, in a room 
with somebody who you really respect and they're playing the piano, you're playing the guitar, or you're writing something, I still go, oh, I was about to swear, <laughs> I still go, blimey, I'm like sitting here writing the song yeah. with this person, you know. Who do you listen to then, Dave, when you're not composing yourself? I mean, is there anybody, I mean, I'm sure it probably changes all the time, but you know, do you sort of go home and think, I always like this piece of music and this is going to relax me, or is it mm. it's just sort of eclectic mixes? It's all different, you know, I listen to bands like Arcade Fire or somebody, you know, like Bright Eyes or this kind of band. I love listening to the Arctic Monkeys. I love, uh, you know, the fact that lyrically he can bring out something about fishnet stockings and, you know, I mean, <coughs> There's so many bands that I like, uh, Mika. Um, the thing is that um, I still listen though to, you know, Astral Weeks by Van Morrison or, you know, Sticky Fingers by The Stones or uh, early Velvet Underground records. And I still listen to classical music. Out of your- Oh, I was just thinking actually, uh, he's one of the few guys that could uh, enter to sing There Must Be An Angel. Mika, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, he's got the <laughs> voice. He's the only one that could probably hit that <laughs> note, yeah. Is there anybody that you, I mean, looking at your songbook, I can't think there's anybody that you haven't worked with, but mm. is there anybody that's still kind of you thinking, I just need to get him in the book? I mean, is there anybody, maybe a, a dead even, that you think, oh, I wish I'd have done that with that person or worked mm, with that? Well, obviously I would have loved to have been in a studio with John Lennon at the same time, being the tape up and making the tea, you know. <laughs> and um, I loved being in the studio on There Must Be an Angel, you know, we had Stevie Wonder play harmonica and recording him was mind-blowing. Yeah. I'd love to be in the studio with him again. Um, I liked being in the studio with Al Green. It was like unbelievable. I mean, we had to get three different microphones because the first one blew up, the second one blew up because him actually and Mick Jagger are two vocalists where their voices got the same kind of power as a trumpet. Yeah. You know how loud a trumpet yeah. is? Well, when they sing in the room next to you, it's kind of like, God, you know. So um, there's so many people I think are great well, um, that I could love to work with. What is the, your take on today's reality TV to break through? I mean, personally, I see it as new faces and opportunity knocks. Mm -hmm. There's a different format. It's, it's a TV talent show. Mm. Do you think when they go through that, um, is it a fast track and, and do, should they have maybe grafted a bit in a few pubs and sweated it out with a band? Or if you were starting out today, do you think, mm, you know, I might have gone for that? No, I, I don't think I would have went on one of these uh, talent contests. Although, as you say, they've always been around. I remember as a kid watching, is it Thank You, Lucky Stars <laughs> or whatever it was. There were these programs that were talent competitions. You, I think people jumble up, you know, they're aimed at a different kind of person who's going to be, you know, a Nirvana fan yeah. or uh, an Arctic Monkeys fan or a Red Hot Chili Peppers fan. Or, and they were back then, you know. I mean, we used to watch uh, Top of the Pops and on would come like The Who doing My Generation followed by Petula Clark or whatever. And it's still a bit like that today. Yeah. For my favourite track, Who's that girl? Mm. The, the the opening chords of that, where did that come to you from? It's a beautiful, is it like a harpsichord sound? Uh, where did you come up with that? Brilliant. Yeah, actually that was Annie that wrote uh, the dun 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 yeah. dun, and the sound, We, I think I would got this very first ever synthesizer made in New York. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it now. I was the, always obsessed with looking for new sounds and, and it was on this special synthesizer that you could mix sounds you know you could mix a harpsichord with a little bit of this mm. a little bit of that and it was a called a Vietra that was it wow and is there any song that you've written that surprised you that became a hit and you were writing and you thought I like this um, you know I'm not sure where this will go and then you suddenly think hmm it's gone it's mm. brilliant mm -hmm. did you ever think that uh, we've had kind of the other way around Annie and myself like we when we wrote Sweet Dreams we were like wow this is amazing and you know we had people turn up to hear it you know and turn us down for a publishing deal and and then the label didn't see it as a single if you in Britain you know it was the second or third single off the album um, uh, but you know there's many times where you write something and you think oh god this is definitely a smash but now you've got to go through the whole route and the rigmarole and everything's changed and the radio's changed you know, if people got to hear it, it would be huge. You know? Yeah. 
A lot of stars say that to me about radio play. You know, we were speaking to Sir Cliff recently who said he couldn't get radio play. <laughs> yeah. And it is hard because, you know, they are, as you rightly say, great songs. But if you can't get to hear them, I mean, do you think that that's going to be a, a di more difficult thing for musicians themselves to get through? Because radio seems very select. You either have to have had hits already, mm -hmm. where they just play your old hits, or if you want to get some new stuff, you have to be under 19. It's funny you should say that. I just wrote the forward to a book uh, written by a guy, and the, I think the book's called uh, Greatest Albums Never Sold. <laughs> and there's so many albums that never got released, you know, yeah. um, that the artists think is their greatest work. And, you know, it became, or well, it has become more and more of a problem where mm. record labels are stuck with this very small pipe, you know, this, they can only get so many albums out, and there's only so many radio stations will play it and and you know the record stores have closed down and they're thinking well, how are we ever going to get our money back or how are we even going to launch this yeah. act but fortunately you know just like everything um man has a has an ability to reinvent and it'll all come around and, and it already is you know you strike me as never really relaxing are you you're, are you always is music your relaxation as well or do you have like a, a strange hobby of golf dave you know <laughs> something that you <laughs> don't think oh we never thought you'd do that yeah. i always been worried about playing golf because i know you can swing and put your back out <laughs> and then as a guitar player you know so having a guitar on the shoulder all the time you always have slight back yeah. problems but um i suppose my uh, great relaxation is uh, drinking uh drinking really <laughs> not drinking red wine Never mix vodka martini and sake, which I found out last night. <laughs> and I like um, reading and going to the cinema, but plus the best thing ever is uh, just uh, playing with the kids. Yeah. Dave Stewart, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cheers. Can we do it? I just love, honestly, the, the opening line of that, who's that girl? It's like a film theme sound to me, like it a, should be a film or something. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah exactly. Oh, it's brilliant. You know, I was thinking, yeah, I remember, that actually, from? funny, at the time, Sorry, I think we, we were saying, oh, we were saying, well, I was saying probably, hey, why don't we open it like the beginning of a movie? So that's yeah. probably sort of like ding, ding, ding. Because, you know, you just, at the time I was working in a, um, a club as well, doing, and they used to play, you know, all the mixes of it. And yeah. some of the mi you see, you don't get that. That's what I'm saying about downloads and stuff. You get four mixes sometimes in a 12 inch, didn't you? And think, oh, yeah. I like the way they've done that bit, you know, and now yeah. you don't get that, you know. Well, also, mixes used to have vaguely resemble the record. Yeah. Mixes. <laughs> oh, don't resemble the There's nothing there at all. Yeah, it's never it's, I know.